Hi, and welcome to this live reading from Testament of Feats, Book of Judgments by K.H. Jones, and this is presented by Itsy Bitsy Book Bits. Prologue. 314 turns ago, Molstock Gilst, the first high bard of the Dogs Clan, foretold the beginning, the first reckoning. He announced to those gathered, a lesser god will walk the realm. The god will ruin and heal the land. On the last full moon of the summer season, his shadow will cast over the moon, and it will fall dark for thirteen breaths as he passes. And so the time of the reckoning began. Each turn of seasons recorded by the Order of the Bards, meeting at the sacred place at the same time every turn. Dark-hooded figures gathered on the high plateau, a secret holy place. The last full moon of the summer season rose on this night, 314 turns from the high bard's utterance of the first reckoning. In keeping with the tradition, no fire blazed. No torch marked the rites. A small, unattended fire burned in the distance. The order of the bards sat, eyes fully acclimated to the night. The full moon moved to the center of the open sky, a beautiful display with no clouds, barely a wind, only perfect quiet. Vadir, the oldest of the order, sat, legs crossed, chanting, mumbling for some time, and then stopped. To address the order and the earth, he turned his face to the endless expanse overhead. He spoke loudly and deliberately. This confirmation was foretold by Molstock Gilst, the first of our order, and so began the reckoning of turns. The order has kept the accounting unbroken through the generations, through the passing of one high bard to the next. The lesser god walks the realms this night. The prophecy is witnessed. The chant, heard time and time again, now rang awkward and rehearsed. Only the youngest of the secret sect could not recite it in perfect unison from memory, whispering the melodic phrase, the prophecy is witnessed among themselves. The high bard fell silent, waiting. Others began chanting quietly against the night, searching the majestic dome above them. He is here, a voice whispered. Yes, I see him, another exclaimed in a low, nervous tone. All stared motionless, mesmerized as the edge of the moon grew fuzzy. Within a few moments, half the moon darkened. As the bards watched intently, one gasped. The confirmation as foretold. Another muttered, Quiet! The dark shadow soon overtook the light. The moon was gone to the eye. Only stars remained, shining bright in the clear, moonless night for a count of twelve, thirteen, and then the dark gave way again to a thin, bright line. Slowly the moon regained its original round, luminescent form as if something had indeed passed in front of it. The display ended as simply as it began. The high bard instructed, light the fire, celebrate the confirmation. Hooded men brought lit torches from the small fire in the distance. Built beforehand, a huge dark structure of firewood stood, towering up in the moonlight. It caught quickly, the blaze painting the flat mountaintop orange and red. Dazzling flashes leapt into the night in long wavy sheets, visible for a day's walk, if not more. The somber occasion turned festive. That which was long foretold had come to pass. The prophecies witnessed... The lesser god walked the realm on this night. The order of the bards faced the fire, arms raised, shouting, and singing. As the night wore on, the wizened high bard spoke again, his solemn face not lifted. His troubled, cryptic voice drew everyone into concerned silence. The lesser god walks the realm. His handiwork shall be seen and unseen. He gives to his children a tragic king, birthed under this waning moon, rising from shackles a forbidden relic hidden from the race of men. Its wrath awaits. A god is ruined. A monster is now birthed under this moon. A painted bear arrives. His arm protects the clans. Birthed under this moon, a broken hero. Nay, no, not broken, stained, etched by trial. The hero is birthed under this moon. The land will be ruined. The land will be healed. Vidir's words trailed off. The crackle of the flames broke the silence and filled the night air. He was grief-stricken, his pain visible as he stared back into the souls of the bards surrounding him. He bowed his head and searched the soil in front of him, and then, under his breath, he said, I am a man no more. With that, he became an owl and flew away. The others stood amazed, confused. This was not the ritual they had prepared. Teal a tall, broad-shouldered underbard, walked the two-day trek home in silence. He contemplated the words of the old man. The mysterious birth troubled the order. 
A second foretelling had been expected, but nothing that dire. The younger bards had hoped for better times for their people. It was not to be. The young bard arrived home in the late afternoon. He found his cherished wife in bed. An aunt and a midwife sat nearby. He rushed to her side. His wife had been well when he left her. Are you unwell? What is wrong, Tish? The aunt spoke for the young woman. Your child arrived earlier than expected. Is Tish all right? The baby? You said next month. Is it too soon? Teal sat on the edge of the bed, placing his hand in Tish's. She smiled wanly. A little soon, but they will be fine. Your child was in a hurry to see this world, it would seem. The large woman concealed any concerns she held under a toothless matronly grin. When the newborn let out a melodic wail fit for a bard, the midwife placed the child in his father's arms. Hello, my night song, Teal crooned. The little one wrapped his tiny hand around his father's large finger and nuzzled into the warmth of his body, a sensation that lifted the wor worry from the underbard's brow, if only for the moment. Chapter One It was a season of journeys, 342 turns by the bard's unbroken reckoning. Night's scream neared Oot's watch. Smoke rose from a large figure milled around a well-established campfire. Strange days. Never had a scream arrived to find this camp occupied by Oot, the rec rec reclusive, reclusive woodsman giant with long hair and a thick beard, both as red as a mountain sunset. You look like shit, little man, boomed Utrin Bacall, crouching to tend the fire he'd been circling. Well, usually I have time to freshen up before our date. Scream, trail-weary and dirty, managed a generous grin behind his unkempt black beard, which gave him an unaged appearance, though at 27 turns he had yet to reach his prime. Scream's long black hair, worn at the knot atop his head, was sprinkled liberally with gray strands. Patrolling the highlands did that to the rangers, aged them early. Only the best warriors from the Dogs Clan were trained to scout and patrol the lands as rangers, and Scream was one of the best. The immense figure stood in a low thunder of laughter rolled toward the ranger. Well, at least you brought jokes, since I don't smell any blackwood meat onto that pony. The giant's powerful sense of smell was unknown to most other races, a closely held secret. They called themselves woodsmen, and it was best to address them as such, most being half again the size of a man, some smaller, some larger. Well proportioned for their size, they were surprisingly agile and graceful. The clans held them in high esteem. In fact, many of the bard's secret sites, sacred sites once belonged to Oot's forerunners. Seldom violent without being harshly provoked, they were thoughtful, intelligent souls, quiet in both word and deed. Woodsmen were a reckless, reclusive race who seldom welcomed guests, but screams curried a loose friendship with Oot, whereby the giant gained news of man's wanderings and scream learned of the forest. The giants knew much of the goings-on in the area, and Oot was a val valuable source of information. Agile, despite his powerful build, Oot made a great game of sneaking up on Scream to scare the daylights out of the man. Knowing something so big could get so close without warning left Scream unnerved. To travel so fast and disappear so easily, they must have ancient powers, as the rumors claimed. Powers greater than their keen sense of smell. Oot's hospitality extended only to a select few dog rangers, did not extend into the woods. Scream knew better than to follow the giant to his house or go near his family and never brought anyone else on these visits. Scream dismounted, loosened the horse's tack in his bedroll, then dropped it all in a pile. To show he bore no weapon, he saluted as if greeting a fellow ranger, placing his relaxed right hand to his chest over his heart and then simply waving the hand forward in a level sweep. You do know Blackwood meat is shit. <coughs> it's better than no mead, replied the woodsman giant flatly. That's one thing we agree on then, brother, acknowledged Scream, enjoying the ease of their friendship. The stool will be ready soon. Your favorite, turnips and beets. Beet stew is better than no stew, Scream rolled his eyes at his friend's attempt at levity. No one loved beets and turnips. Uterin Bacalt shook his head as he stirred the pot. You better at least have a few leaves of tobacco tucked away in a pocket. His deep voice rumbled into a primal growl as he er added more herbs to the soup. The giant looked up just in time to catch a small leather pouch before it smacked him in the face. He sniffed the opening and smiled. Can always count on a dog's ranger for smoke. The two worked in silence for a time, scream tending to his horse and kit, oot to the stew and smoke. 
Oot's pipe looked more like a knotted root, but it held an orange glow in the bowl just the same as he pulled smoke through a long, crooked finger. The dusk faded into night while the fragrance of the stew and the aroma of pipe smoke hung in the cool alpine air, the scent a nourishment in itself. Scream stood with his back to the fire. Face upturned, he took in the stars. He looked forward to his meetings with Oot and used the giant's campsite whenever he was in the area. Sometimes the giant would join him and they would spend a night or two around the fire talking and catching up. Scream relished stories of the clans long ago and particularly enjoyed the woodsman's rich knowledge of the clan's, dog's clan, things even the bards had forgotten. Oot gathered next to him, pushing a large wooden bowl of steaming soup his way. Scream turned his attention from the night sky to his friend. Thank you, brother. Both men ate and stared out at the great beyond. From Oot's watch, one would think a bird could fly straight to the moon. The Tarka, as the woodsman giants called them, were grassy overlooks where they could relax yet see vast distances. Oot broke the silence with a formal tone. Why are you here, ranger? I'm looking for the Morbera, the sea bears. Scream had extended his patrol by two moons, searching for clues about the disappearance of Warhold, an older ranger and friend, and his kinsmen Fulcrum and Grimaldin, all hailing from distant Morbera. Warhold had not been seen in at least two seasons, well past the old sea bear's routine visits to Blackwood, the capital of the dog's clan. When Scream's quiet investigation produced no answers, he'd grown concerned for his fellow ranger. The giant gave the question of the missing sea bears a minute to soak before he spoke. The very men you seek asked what I might know about the growing malevolence in Dias. It has been some time since I last shared a fire with the rangers from Morbera, a few seasons mayhap. Mor Warhold and his crew used this camp three times a season, that I can say. He liked to be here when the moon was full. I always enjoyed their company, and Tobak. Oot paused a chuckle, perhaps at a fond memory. They asked about the malevolence, the spiritual unrest, in these parts? Yes. The giant puffed on his strange pipe, which looked better suited for kindling. And? Scream prompted. The ethereal winds blow from the lands of the Faerun. That is what I know. That is all I know. And that is what I told your friends. Only the crackle of the fire broke the quiet until Scream finally voiced his thoughts. The Bones clan must have disturbed something within the ruined walls of the Faerun in their lands. Something ancient. Something miserable. Did Warhold say if they were if he were going to investigate? Nay. Scream pressed, perturbed. What did he say then? Tell me what you can. The giant possessed such an amazing memory he could recite a story once told word for word. Surely he knew more. Oot grunted and frowned at the smaller man. He spoke of completing his patrol and seeking the counsel of the bards. Not much for words, as you well know well enough. He was low on provisions. Wildling heads were strung across his horse, chieftains of three war bands from their markings. The giant's normally serious face loosened into a broad grin before issuing a rough cackle. The Morbera hailed from the north and west of the dog's lands, a fair-skinned, big-boned people with long braids and thick beards. They looked like smaller versions of the woodsmen, save for the Morbera's skin, heavily adorned with gruesome symbols of their exploits and battles. Tonight's open display of emotion was unusual for the giant. Whatever the sea bears were doing, the giant approved. Grom was nursing an infected wound on the, his shoulder, and Fulcrum was missing half of two fingers from a hand. He had them strung on a necklace. When I asked about this, the man replied, Are they not my brother's fingers to do with as he choose? Oot laughed at that recollection, allowing himself to enjoy the full humor of the thought. He glanced over at Scream. When Scream failed to reply, Oot nudged the ranger. This is funny, is it not? When Scream still would not join in, Oot finished his retelling. I patched them up, provided a poultice for the infection, and shared some tea to help them sleep. <coughs> a day later, they rode out, risking Oot's good disposition by asking for more information. Scream stretched the liberties the giant offered him. And what did you read, my friend? The giant frowned and glanced over at the ranger, then stared into the fading fire. After some time, he grunted. <coughs> and spoke in a low-measured tone meant to contain his agitation. I read your desperation, my little friend. Sc Scream bowed his head. He would accept that jab if it purchased information. The giant sighed a long exhale as if disappointed. I do not read minds. I sense true emotions. 
With practice and peace with a few words, it can be equally as effective. The men were exhausted, yet strangely at peace with whatever task drew them. I did smell fear on them, though. The faint stench of terror, they hid it well from each other.